All right, I suppose we'll get started. So today we're going to start talking about group schemes. Uh, so a good reference for today is Tate's article uh, called Finite Flat Group Schemes. Which is in a book. It's in a book called Modular Forms and Firm Mod's Last Theorem. All right, so why are we interested in group schemes? Well, if you remember, if, if you use a super singular elliptic curve, over, let's say, Fp. Then if you look at its p torsion, it has no Fp bar points. So by taking the Fp bar points, you get this thing, which is a Gal representation. And you'd like to study it maybe to you know, that point of view, but it's completely trivial, it's zero. But you know that E of p is a degree p squared subscheme. So there's a lot there in the subscheme. You just can't see it at the level of points. And of course, it's a subgroup scheme because it's the kernel of the group homomorphism. So this is an example of a group scheme that's it's interesting. You can't study it by studying points, but it's still there and important for us. So it's this sort of thing that we want to understand better, and we're just going to study all group schemes. That we do. So before we even study group schemes, I want to talk about sort of the categorical generalities, uh, which is group objects and categories. So let's start with C being a category. And for the moment, let me assume that it has all finite products. Um, so all finite products means in particular, the empty product, which is the final object, and I'll call that point. Okay, so a group object in C uh, is the following. So it's a tuple. G, M, I, and E, I'm going to call it, uh, as follows. So G is an object of C. Uh, M is uh, a morphism from G times G to G, which is called the multiplication map. I is a map from G to G which is the inversion map. You should think of that as x goes to x inverse. And this last one, E, is a map from point, the final object, to G, which is the identity element, or maybe the identity section. So this is the data that you require for a group object. So then there are some axioms. So you want associativity of the multiplication. And the trick to these axioms is just to think about the normal axioms for a group and try to write down. Uh, than without elements. So associativity means that if we do a triple product, so we have three elements x, y, z, we can first multiply y and z, which is this map, and then we can multiply x and the result, or we can first multiply x and y, and then multiply the result. And this diagram should commute. So the associativity axiom is this diagram commutes. And 
then there's an axiom saying that the identity element is really the identity element. And what that, I mean, that means that if you multiply anything in G by the identity section, you should get the same thing back. So the way to say that categorically, well, G is equal to, or match that is morphic to the product of G in the final element, the final object, uh, just by the universal property of the final object. And you can map this via the identity map in E to G times G. So you should think of this composite map as like including X into X comma the identity element. And then you can multiply to get back to G. So that's like doing the product of X and the identity element. And the axiom says that this composite map should be the identity. G. So this says that this identity section is has the property of the identity for multiplication on the right. Of course, you also want the same thing if you switch the order of E and the identity there. And then there's the uh, axiom for inverses. Okay, and so this says that if you start with G, so you think of an element X here, and then we're going to map it by the diagonal map to X comma X, and then by the identity in the inversion map to what you should think of as X comma X inverse, and then we multiply. So this is like doing the product of X with X inverse, and so this should be the identity, which means there's a universal map from G to the point that this diagram should commute. And again, this is saying that I is a right inverse. You should also have the axiom where I is the left inverse, which means switching these two. Okay, and th this is the, the entire definition. Group object has this data and these axioms. Any questions? So if you apply this definition where your category C is the category of sets, you get normal groups. Um, in other situations, you get other things. Um, you could do that and get a more general definition, I suppose. Um, we're just going to need products. Uh, and of course, you can also talk about commutative groups. So there's a commutativity axiom. And of course, that just says that this diagram commutes. So there's a switching of factors in that, which I'll call tau, which takes xy to yx. And uh, you're commuted if this diagram commutes. Uh, so if G and H are group objects in C, then a homomorphism between them, G to H, is a morphism in C. Such that all the diagrams can be pictured. I'm not going to write this one out. And so this implies that there's a category of group objects in C. Okay, so uh, an important point of view is the functor of points, especially when we're going to be talking about algebraic geometry. So for an object X in C, um, and let's say a test object T in C, uh, put H sub X of T to be the Hans from T into X. So this hx is then a functor from C to the category of sets, right? It assigns to everything in P a set, and it's contravariant. You can put it out there. This is called the functor represented by x. And the Yoneda lemma says that, well, x is determined from hx. Uh, there's a more precise statement about H giving a 
fully faithful embedding of C into the functor category. But this means that you can do many operations uh, in terms of the functor of points and transfer it back to the original object. And this is uh, actually it's a very clarifying point of view when you end up working with group schemes. Because, well, we'll see. So if G is a group object, and C, then you can show that HG of T is naturally a group in the ordinary sense. Uh, the multiplication map on G just induces a multiplication map on this set, and you can check that it satisfies the group axioms. And this is sort of why this functor of points view is useful. Is you know group objects are kind of abstract things, but this lets you work with them in terms of just ordinary groups. So furthermore, if you have some map from, of test objects in C, uh, then there's a pullback map from H G of T prime to H G of T. And this is a group homomorphism. So in other words, this is saying that the functor HG is naturally um, given the structure of a functor from G to the category of groups. The converse of this is true as well. So if you start with an object G, if G is just some object in C, such that HG of T has the structure of a group for all T, meaning you give some group structure on this set for every T, and F star is a homomorphism for all maps F in the category, you have this structure, then G is naturally a group object. So this is a good exercise with the Unitas lemma if you've never played it before. In fact, I think I'll give some exercises uh, for this material. Uh, I'll write some up and put them up online and let you know. Uh, maybe this would be one of them. Okay, uh, so the last kind of general thing I want to talk about is the notion of kernel and co-kernel. So suppose we have a homomorphism of group objects in C. So there's a trivial group object in C, which for the moment I'll call one. So the underlying object of C is the final object, and all the morphisms are just determined. Well, one point I wanted to make about this representable functor point of view. Uh, this shows you that you can define, um, I mean, giving G the structure of a group object is the same thing as giving HG the structure of a group object in the functor category. And that's actually a more flexible definition, because you can make that definition without requiring that C has products. The way I originally said it, you know, you needed a map from G times G. But here you can get around that. So if your category doesn't have products, you can still define the notion of group object in that way. Okay, anyway. Kernel and co-kernel. So we have this trivial group object in C, and like in the category of normal groups, this is both initial and final in the category of group objects, meaning it's what's called a zero object in category theory. So there's a notion of kernel and co-kernel whenever you have that. So the kernel of F is the fiber product of one kernel of F is, well, you could say the equalizer of the two maps from G to H. One is F, and the other one is the trivial map. 
send everything to one. I mean, this map is the map which sends the first map g to one and then one to h. So in other words, this by definition is the fiber product the thing here. That's the kernel. And the co-kernel is the co equalizer. So just a dual thing. So if your category has fiber products or co-fiber products or whatever, then these things automatically exist. So the kernel, as with any equalizer, is defined in terms of the maps into it. Right? Giving a map to the kernel is the same as giving a map to G, which composes with F to the identity map. So you can understand maps to the kernel, and that means that you can understand what functor represents. What the functor represents is defined in terms of maps to it. So if we evaluate this functor h of the kernel f on a test object, this is just the kernel of the map that f induces from g to h. It's as nice as it could be. In general, though, you can't understand H of the co -kernel. So in general, there's no good description for H of co -kernel. And that's because the co -kernel is defined in terms of the maps out of it. And H is talking about maps into it. In particular, uh, it's not true that H of the co -kernel of F the value of that t is the co-kernel of the map that f induces. That's not true. In general. This is one reason why co-kernels are more subtle. Okay, any questions? Uh, you mean if you want to look at maps from group objects? That's right, everything's going to flip around. Oh, it should be. It's anything, it's co-groups, I guess. It's not going to be groups. Uh, OK, so now we're going to move on to group schemes. So the, the definition is obvious. So a group scheme is a group object in the category of schemes. And usually we want to work over some base scheme. So a group scheme over S and the category of schemes over S. So the product is going to be fiber product over S. And so uh, an example, one that we've already been working with, uh, an abelian variety is just a group scheme, which is a variety, which is a complete variety. That's the definition of an abelian variety. With what? To, to the category of groups. But you want it to be representable, right? That's where the scheme part comes in. Yeah. Instead of using affine, using affine instead of all of them. 
I think that just comes down to a, a theorem that the functor of points is determined by its values on half lines. So you don't lose information by restricting to half lines. So today we're going to be talking about only affine group schemes, which is the opposite of Gilling Gardens. Gilling Gardens are complete, you can deal with affine and mostly finite group schemes. Finite's even much stronger than that. Yeah. Yeah, that's what this is getting at. Um, I mean, in certain circumstances, that's true. Yeah. I don't know if I just get an arbitrary category of what that means. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the functor of points is hum into the thing, right? Which is a left exact functor, and left exact oh, just to make with like all limit operations, and the kernel is a limit because it's a fiber product. So that's why you get this nice behavior. Okay, so you know that. Uh, Let's work over a field K. Everything today is going to be over a field K from now on. So you know that affine schemes over K, this category is contravari contravariantly equivalent, obviously anti-equivalent, to K algebras, commutative K algebras. So since you have this equivalence of categories, you get an equivalence of group objects in the categories. So this says that affine group schemes, so an affine group scheme should correspond to, well, not a group object in the other category because it's an anti-equivalence, but a group object where you flip all the arrows around. So you might call that a co-group object. So let me be more precise about what that means. So suppose G is spec A and G is a group. Well, you have the multiplication map on G. So that's a, a map of schemes from G times G to G. So under this equivalence, this will go to a, a homomorphism of K algebras from A to A tensor A. And this map here, I'm going to denote delta, and it's called co-multiplication. Uh, the identity section of G, so that's a map from spec K to G. This is what I was calling E. This gets flipped around into a map from A to K. And this is called the co-unit. And then the inversion map, that's a map from G to G. Well, that just becomes a map from A to A. And this is called the antipode. And then, of course, you have the axioms that G satisfies. So multiplication is associative. That turns into co-multiplication being co-associative. You can guess what that means from the obvious diagram. So an affine group scheme corresponds to a K algebra with all this extra structure on it, and that's called a Hopf algebra. So it, it's nicer, so to define a Hopf algebra, you could say it's a K algebra with all this, but it's a more symmetric way to say the definition. So the definition, a Hopf algebra over K is a K vector space A with the following data. You want a multiplication map. So that's a map from A tensor A to A. You want a unit map. That's a map from K to A. Co-multiplication. That's from A to A tensor A. And co-unit. That's from A to K. And antipode. And that's from A to A. So it should have all of this. And then there are axioms. So such that, and I'm not going to write them out. Associativity, co-associativity, a bunch of other stuff. 
But the nice thing from writing it this way is that uh, it's symmetrical with respect to flipping the arrows around. And the axioms are symmetrical as well. So uh, what we can say then is that uh, affine group schemes over K, this category is contravariantly equivalent to the category of commutative Hopf algebras over K. So you, you, in general, you don't have to have a required commutativity for Hopf algebras. But of course, if we're dealing with schemes, everything's going to be commutative K-algebras. And then, of course, the, I mean, this is all group schemes, including non-commutative ones. And of course, you have the commutative group schemes. So the commutativity condition here corresponds to co-commutativity over here. So there's that equivalence of categories as well. Let's do some examples. There's some basic group schemes everyone should know. So in what follows, I'm going to let T be spec R. This is just going to be a test object. Uh, so the first example is the additive group. So it's denoted uh, GA, and it's defined to be spec of K joint T. So it's just isomorphic to A1 as a scheme. So GA of T, the functor of points, I'm going to write this for maps from T to GA. So this is um, canonically equal to just R. There are no functions on T. And this is a group under addition. So and it, if you have a map of schemes, then you get a group homomorphism here. You can check that. It's obvious. So that means that we've endowed the functor of points of GA with a group structure. And so that means that GA has the structure naturally of an additive uh, of a of group scheme. And so you should be able to see that, of course, in terms of a hot algebra structure on the coordinate ring. And it's easy to write down what these things are. So the co-multiplication map. So this implies that GA is naturally a group scheme. And I'll just tell you what co-multiplication is. So the co-multiplication map goes from K of T to K of T tensor K of T. And it takes the element T to T tensor 1 plus 1 tensor T. OK, so quiz. Where does t squared go? Anybody? Hmm? The tensors are the What did you say? You square this? Hmm? Yes, that's right. It doesn't go to t squared tensor 1 plus 1 tensor t squared. So this is a homomorphism of algebras. So you can figure everything out from that, because t generates the algebra here. So t squared goes to the square of this thing. Don't make that mistake. OK, the next example is the multiplicative group. So uh, this is denoted GM, and the scheme is K join T, T inverse, stack of that. So as a scheme, this is just A1 with the origin removed. 
its functor of points, gm of t is just equal to the units in R. And this is a group under multiplication. So again, that fact means that this thing has a group scheme, group scheme structure, and you can easily say what the co-multiplication is. It takes t to t tensor t. And you can figure everything out from there, because again, it's an algebra. Okay, uh, next example is constant groups. So let G be just an ordinary group. Uh, so I'm going to define uh, G underline to be the scheme, which is the disjoint union of copies of spec K, one for each element of G. So giving a map from a scheme T to this scheme G, well, this G underlined thing is just a disjoint unit of points. So there's not really very many interesting maps. You have to collapse all the connected components. So this is the same thing as a map from the set of components, which I'll call pi 0, into just the set of components of this thing, which is just the normal group G. And since G has a group structure, you can endow this HOM set with a group structure. <coughs> and so this thing is a group scheme. And the top algebra you can describe as follows. So G is spec of A, where A is the sum of copies of K, one for each element. But I'm not going to write it that way. So A is best thought of as the functions on G with values in K. So the tensor product of A with itself is naturally identified with functions on g times g with values in k. And so the co-multiplication map, you can think of it as a map like this. It takes a function on g and gives you a function on g times g. And the way it does that is delta f evaluated at a pair of elements of g, it's just f of the product. So here's another question for you. How does this functions on G compare to the group algebra of G? Are they the same or different? Yeah, they're different in general. Um, I mean, the way that you usually define I mean, the group algebra, multiplication ends in multiplication. Mm -hmm. So if the group's not commutative, that's not a commutative algebra. But the functions on G, I mean, the way I've defined it, it's always a commutative algebra. So I think maybe this is what someone was saying. I mean, you can sort of identify these two things as vector spaces, like delta functions going to the elements of the group. But in, in one point of view, you're doing pointwise multiplication, and the other, you're doing convolution. So it depends whether, you know, okay, so that's the difference. They're not always the same. Another example that's going to be important for us is roots of unity. So this uh, is denoted UN, the group scheme of nth roots of unity. Yes. Yeah. At least if G is fine, yeah. Um, okay, so the scheme of nth roots of unity, it's spec of K joint T mod p to the n minus 1. That's how I'm going to define it for the moment. The functor of points is easy to say. So giving a, 
a map from T to mu n. Uh, it's the same thing as giving an element x in the coordinate ring of T that satisfies x to the n equals 1. So it's the group of nth roots of unity in R. It's a group under multiplication that gives mu n a group structure. And in fact, uh, mu n is the kernel of multiplication by n on g n. Okay, and one last example, which is in some ways the most interesting one, uh, this thing called alpha p. So here uh, we must assume that a has characteristic p. And alpha p is the scheme spec k join t mod t to the p. Functor of points. So giving a homomorphism from R to this ring all the way around is the same thing as giving an element of R whose peak power is zero. And that's a group under addition because we're in characteristic peak. So the alpha p is a group scheme, and in fact, alpha p is equal to the kernel of the Frobenius map on G A. Okay, does anyone have any questions? All right, so hopefully this gives you a bunch of examples to keep in mind. So from now on, we're going to be interested pretty much only in finite group schemes. All right, so from now on, well, at least for this lecture, G is finite. I mean finite in the sense of scheme theory. So that means that it's coordinate ring K is finite dimensional over our base field K. So we define the order of G to be the dimension of A. I'll just write that as you usually write the order. All right, so the first thing that I want to um, say is this theorem of growth and about quotients, which I'm not going to prove. So uh, I'm going to state it uh, not at all in full generality, very specific to the situation that we're in. So I'm going to say that uh, G is a finite group scheme over K, and H is a closed subgroup scheme. Okay, so there's going to be three statements I'm going to make. So first of all, the quotient exists in the sense that I previously defined it in a categorical sense. And the quotient is a finite group scheme over K. Oh, um, let me make it commutative. Right? The quotient's not going to be a group if it's not a normal subgroup. And it's a, the quotient exists and it's a finite uh, group scheme over K. Uh, secondly, the orders work out as you'd expect. The order of G mod H is the order of G divided by the order of H. And third, you can define, you can um, characterize the functor of points of the quotient. So remember, this is the thing that I said you can't do in general, right? Because it maps into something that you're defining it maps out of. But in this situation, you can describe it. So the functor of points of G mod H, it's the quotient of the functor of points of G by the functor of points of H, um, regarded as sheaves.
on, say, the big FPPS thing. So let me say a little bit about what that last one means. It's not going to be very important for us, at least for a while. Uh, but I'll give you some idea of what it means if you don't know. So uh, if you have some scheme x, then you get this functor hx in the category of schemes. It goes from schemes to sets. Uh, and so you, you know, you'd like to know when is a functor representable of the form hx. Uh, so one thing that the hx is satisfied is that they are sheaves for the FPPF site. Uh, which means they satisfy some conditions. If you have some FPPF map, then there's some descent condition that happens. And so if you have an arbitrary functor for it to be representable, it better at least satisfy that, because every representable functor does satisfy that. So if you have an arbitrary functor, which you can think of as a pre-sheaf, there's a way to sheafify it and get something that at least satisfies this minimal condition. And basically what this is saying is that if you do sort of the naive quotient of HG by HH, just pointwise do the co-kernel, that's like doing the pre-sheaf quotient. That typically won't be a sheaf. But this is saying that all you have to do is sheafify that, and then you get the functor of points of the actual quotient. OK, so if you're not familiar with a lot of those words, it probably won't matter too much. But I had to read up on some of this topology theory. Uh, any questions? Oh, so the, the first part of the theorem actually isn't so hard to prove. Um, you want to show that co-kernels exist in this category. It's the same thing as showing that kernels exist in the category of hot algebras. You can just find them by doing a fiber product. So we're just going to not worry about the proof of this and just use it. Uh, an important corollary is that the category of finite commutative group schemes is abelian. OK. So now I want to talk about a tau group schemes. So our, I guess the goal that we're working towards, so I'm just trying to develop the theory so that we can use it, but uh, we're trying to sort of understand the structure of group schemes, in general, finite group schemes. The tau group schemes are the easiest ones. Whenever you see the word tau, you should think this is going to be very easy. So it's, it's, uh, the category of a tau group schemes admits a nice description. So that's what I'm going to recall now. So first, recall that if, if A is a finite dimensional K algebra, then A is a tau if and only if it's a product, finite product of separable extensions of K. And in characteristic zero, so if you're in characteristic zero, this is the same thing as saying that A is reduced. So suppose that A is a finite dimensional tau algebra and let Ks be the separable closure of K. Then if we tensor A up to K, to Ks, well, since this thing's a finite product of separable extensions, when we tensor up, we're just going to get a bunch of Ks's. So this is going to decompose as some product of Ks's over some index set, x and some finite set now. And so if you actually think about doing this, like imagine, imagine A is a field. Like imagine you're joining the square root of 2 to q. And we tensor up to q bar. So you have q join root 2 tensor q bar. So now I'm saying that that's isomorphic to q bar times q bar as rings. So to actually carry out that decomposition, you need to find the idempotents in the tensor product. And they're going to involve root twos in some way, right? You're going to have to write down some formula with root twos and stuff. And so that means they're not going to be defined over Q. And so the Galois group is going to move those idempotents around. 
And the set i is basically the set of minimal item points. So you're going to get a Galois action. GK is going to act on the set i. So this defines a functor from the category of finite tau algebras, the category of finite GK sets. You can go the opposite way as well. So suppose we start with a finite GK set I. So I'll define uh, A bar to be the product of KSs over I, and let GK act on that, both on the KSs and on the index set I. And then A I'll take to be the ring of Galois invariants in this thing. And you can show that that's a finite uh, tau algebra. So this gives us a functor in the opposite direction. So we call this one phi and this one psi. So it's a, an important theorem, but not very hard to prove that these two things are quasi-inverse. The quasi-inverse equivalences of categories. So that's a good exercise you should do if you haven't thought about this stuff before. So a, a corollary, just sort of a rephrasing of this theorem is that the functor from finite tau schemes over k to finite gk sets, the functor which takes such a scheme x to its set of ks points is an equivalence. The reason being finite tau algebras are equivalent to finite tau schemes, and this functor phi which takes the algebra a to the set i. Well, i is just the set of ks points. So that's why it works like this. Oh, I mean, these are functors, so when you do the composition, it's not the identity functor, but isomorphic to the identity functor. Yeah, yeah, they're equivalences of categories, and they're inverses to each other in the sense of category. OK, so this gives a good description of the category of finite tau schemes. The category of finite tau groups is just the group objects in this category. So this equivalence is going to induce one on the categories of group objects. And I'm just going to phrase it for commutative group objects. Uh, so I mean, a, a group object here is going to be a group which GK acts on. And so an abelian, a commutative group object here is a commutative group which GK acts on, which you can think of as just the GK module. Group of action. So we get the finite tau, finite tau commutative group schemes are equivalent to finite GK modules. The functor being take a group G and send it to its chaos points. So in other words, studying finite tau group schemes is the same thing as studying Galois representations, finite Galois representations. And this is part of the reason why when we were thinking about elliptic curves, we were able to get so much information out of the Galois representation attached to torsion, because it's not really we're getting much information in the calculus. All right, so the tau things are nice and easy. It's very easy to understand them. Um, the first thing to say about the non tau case is that you can sort of split off an tau piece canonically and get some other piece. And this is what's called the connected tau sequence. So 
So let's start with a finite commutative group scheme G, spec A. So A is an Artinian K algebra, it's finite dimensional over K. And so it decomposes into a product of local Artinian algebras. So, there's a, so I here is some finite index set. So there's a, a unique element, which I'll call zero in I, such, the, such that the co-unit of A factors through A0. And I'm going to define uh, G0 to be spec of A0 which is a closed subgroup of G. And this is called the identity component. So another way to think of this, um, if you think of G, it's the spectrum of a, an Artinian K algebra. So it's a scheme. So its underlying topological space is just a discrete set of finite limited points. And then there's some possibly reduced subscheme structure on each one of those points. The identity element of G is a map from spec K into G, so it's going to hit one of those points. And this G0 is just that point with the subscheme structure that it already has. So I'm also going to let A sub a tau be the maximal a tau subalgebra of A. And this can be described explicitly as follows. So first of all, it's the product of the maximal tau subalgebras of each AI. And this thing, in the local case, is the separable closure of K in AI. So it's just the elements of AI which are separable over here. I'm going to let G a tau be the spec of this subalgebra. So it comes with a, a map from G to G a tau because A tau is a subalgebra. Now this tau subalgebra has some obvious universal property with respect to maps from a tau algebras into A. And using that, you can show that uh, this is the universal map to an tau group. Universal homomorphism to an tau group scheme. And I should have said here, so this G0 is connected because it's spec of a local ring. It has a K point, right? The co-unit is a K point of it. So it's connected and has a rational point over the base field, which means that it's geometrically connected. So G0 connected plus has K point implies geometrically connected. And that implies that G0 times G0 is still connected. Since it's geometrically connected. And so that means that if you look at the multiplication map, and that's G0 times G0 into G, it has to actually go into G0. Because it's going to, of course, hit the identity element still. And since it's connected, it has to go to that connected component. So this implies that G0 is a subgroup of G. I'll just say that before. And similarly, you can show that um, by some property of the maximal tau subalgebra, if you're using tensor products, you can, you can show that this thing is a quotient group of G. Well, I guess I already said implied that G of tau has a group structure. So if you look at the tensor product of A with K over this etal subalgebra, so here the map from A etal to K is the co-unit. So 
So if you think about what this is, it's the maximal quotient of A. where the idempotent defining A0 is the identity element. And so you can show from this description that it's just equal to A0. The natural map from A0 to this thing is an isomorphism. And this tensor product, of course, is the fiber product of this map with the zero group scheme going to G tau. I mean, it's the kernel of this map. So this shows that the sequence from G0 to G to G of tau is exact. I mean, th this computation here is showing that the image here is equal to the kernel there. And so this is the connected to tau sequence. This thing here is connected to the quotient of tau. So this sequence lets you split up the problem of understanding G into understanding connected groups and understanding tau groups. And we already understand the tau groups. They can be described in terms of Galois representations. So let's, this lets you focus on connected groups. of this sequence. Um, well, let me say one thing else first. And then, and then I'll do an interesting example. OK, so before I do an interesting example, let me explain why, in many cases, there are no interesting examples. So suppose that k is perfect. So perfect means that every finite extension is separate. So then uh, so I, I define this maximal tau subalgebra. So uh, AI tau was the separable closure of K and AI. That was the definition. Since K is perfect, this is the algebraic closure of K and AI. And so it maps isomorphically onto the residue field. AI is a local ring. And so this means that if you take A and you kill all the nilpotent elements, look at the reduced quotient algebra, that's isomorphic to A and tau. That's what this is saying. This is the local case in general. It's just the product. So in other words, the map from G reduced, which is a closed subscheme of G, to this quotient G of tau is an isomorphism. And since K is perfect, the product of two reduced schemes stays reduced. And because of that, G reduced is a subgroup of G. The K perfect implies product of reduced is reduced. And that implies that the reduced subscheme is actually a subgroup. Right, because G reduced times G reduced is reduced, so the multiplication at the G has to factor through G reduced. That's why. So this is a subgroup of G, and it maps isomorphically into this quotient. In other words, that's a splitting, right? So this splits the connected tau sequence. So since it's, there's a splitting, uh, it just becomes a product. I'm assuming we're in the commutative case. If you're non a lot of these results I'm saying still hold for non-commutative things, then you get a symmetric product. Uh, and in fact, there are no interesting maps. There are no non-trivial maps from an Natal scheme to a connected scheme, right, this way. So that means that uh, the splitting is unique. So this product is product decomposition is canonical. Okay, so that's what I mean by when you're in this situation where k is perfect, there's not no interesting examples. Okay, so let me give you an interesting example which relates to 
elliptic curves uh, where the sequence does not split. So I hope this is correct, Kartik, you should check me. <laughs> so, uh, all right, so I'm gonna use stuff that we don't actually know yet, but you, you kind of know, so you can kind of pretend I think. So uh, I'm gonna let x be some moduli space of the curves. Over the finite field fp. So for example, you could take x zero then. This example is not you know, important for what we're going to do next. It's just an interesting example. OK. Uh, so um, E, script E, is going to be the universal family. So it's the universal elliptic curve over x. Uh, and then I'm going to let little k, that's playing the same role that it has before, this is going to be the function field of x. So x is a curve, it's a modular curve, so this is going to be um, an extension of fp with transcendence degree 1. And uh, non-script E is going to be the generic fiber of this thing. And then I'll let Gn be the p to the n torsion. Okay, so first of all, uh, E is not defined over the algebraic closure of FP. So why is that? Well, the J invariant uh, defines a function, an algebraic function from X to P1. I mean, X is a space of curves. So every point in X is an elliptic curve, and you can take its J invariant. If that gives you an element of P1, that's an algebraic function. And since X is like the moduli space of all curves, you're going to get all possible J invariants from this function. So this is not a constant function, in other words. So this map is non-constant. And that implies that J, as an element of the function field, is transcendental over FP. But this J is the J invariant of E. Sort of by definition. So this J invariant is transcendental over FP, so that means that property is the J invariant that uh, E can't be defined over FP bar. Okay? So in particular, a corollary of this, since it's not defined over FP bar, that implies that E is ordinary. Because we said that every super singular thing is defined over FP squared. So that means that these GNs, they have FP bar points, or they have K bar points. Because they're ordinary. And so in particular, the tau quotient is non-zero. Uh, of course, since Gn is p-torsion, it's not reduced. We know that. So Gn is not reduced, which means that it's not a tau. I'm sorry, yeah, Gn is not reduced, so it's not a tau. So its identity component is also non-zero. So the two pieces in the connected to tau sequence for the Gn are both non-zero. And now I want to say that the sequence is actually not split, at least if n is large. So why is this? Well, let's go by contradiction. Suppose that we're split for all that. Uh, sorry, connected to tau sequence for GN is not split. So suppose that GN is the product of its connected component and it's a tau component for all that. Well, then you can just sort of take the union as n goes to infinity, and you'll get something for g infinity. So this g infinity is just uh, 
you know, everything that's p, to p to the n torsion for some n. It's called the p divisible group of the curve. And you can show that these two pieces would have to be p divisible as well. It's not like most stuff's going to be here and then this is going to be z minus p. They're both going to be p divisible, each of rank 1. And so since you have this product decomposition, you can define interesting endomorphisms of this group scheme. Right, you can do multiplication by one here and multiplication by two here, and that'll be an endomorphism of the group scheme. So the endomorphisms of this thing uh, are going to contain zp plus zp. By what I just said, you can act by two different numbers on these two different things, uh, and you can act by p-adic numbers because they're divisible groups. And uh, I think you can actually show that it's zp. I mean, I just said the containment, but I think it's kind of clear that you get an equality here. Okay, so what does this tell you? So the endomorphisms of the p-dual group are large. Well, there's a map on the endomorphisms of E. I mean, if you have an endomorphism of E, of course it preserves all the p-torsions, so it's going to induce maps of these p-divisible groups. And in fact, this map is an isomorphism. So that's the Tate conjecture. This is the case of Faulting's isogeny theorem, but over function fields instead of number fields. Is People are probably more familiar with it. But anyhow, this map's an isomorphism. So this says that nd e has rank 2 over z, which means that e has complex multiplication. But cm things are always defined over fp bar. Uh, one way to see that is that if you fix an order, there's only finite many cm things. So some Gal argument will descend you down to some fp bar. So this is a contradiction. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so this isn't, I think there's probably very elementary examples you can write down of a non-split connected tau sequence. Just write down a hot algebra, which is not split probably very easily. But I think this is a nice example uh, of something that's kind of a little more related to the course. Uh, are there any questions about this example? Uh, we're we're going to talk about what Peter's groups are and all the, the words in it later. So just store this in your head for the time being. You don't understand it yet. Yeah, so I mean, in, in this situation for endomorphisms of abelian varieties, I think it's known for any field that's finitely generated over its prime field. Oh, oh, sorry, before fall things, was it known in this situation? I don't know, you know? Okay, I'm not sure. Yeah. Tate proved it over final field. All right, that was fun. So uh, the last thing we'll do today. Uh, is another important bit of structure. Uh, so I want to show that if your order is invertible, then you're a tau. Okay, so this will be back down to earth. <laughs> All right, so as always, G is spec A. A is a finite dimensional K algebra. So the co-unit is a, an algebra homomorphism from A to K. And I'm going to let I be its kernel. So that's some ideal of A. And this actually splits the map from the unit into A. So this gives you, you have a decomposition. A is the direct sum of K and I. I'll let pi be the map which takes A and projects onto I and then onto I mod I squared. So in fact, pi is a derivation. This is an easy exercise. So it satisfies the Leibniz rule. That's what I think. And to see that, you just take two elements of A and write them under this decomposition and look at what their product looks like. So let x1 up to xn be a basis for i mod i squared. I'm going to define a map vi from a to a as follows. So you take a, you do co-multiplication to 
A tensor A. And then you apply the identity map tensor this pi to A mod I squared. Sorry, A tensor I mod I squared. And then you, again, don't do anything through this first tensor factor, and you just apply uh, the dual Xi to this I mod I squared. So I mod I squared is a finite dimensional K vector space. These X's are a basis. The X stars, I mean the dual basis. So this is the map which sends Xi to one and the Xj's to zero. Okay, this might look like some crazy map, but actually what this is, I mean you can think of this as a tangent field on spec A. And this is that uh, translation invariant one, which at the origin is given by this vector X1. X1 you can think of as a, I guess, co-vector at the origin. X1 dual is a tangent vector at the origin. And this is the translation invariant field that that one generates. Okay, but we're not actually going to need to know that description. Of it. So here's a proposition. So two pieces. So first, if characteristic of K is zero, then uh, the map from the polynomial ring on the Xi's to A, which I'll call phi. Oh, sorry. I want Xi, these Xi's to be elements of I which project to a basis in I mod I squared. Okay, so they're actually in A. So that, that's how you make sense of this thing. This is the map that sends the formal variable Xi to the element Xi. Yes? Uh, the tangent bundle on spec, the cotangent bundle of spec A, I mean, as like a coherent sheaf. The omega 1 of A is isomorphic to A tensor I mod I squared, actually. I mean, I mod I squared is the tangent space, so the cotangent space at the origin. And then I'm saying that this omega 1 is, yeah, trivial bundle. And that's the fiber at the origin. Okay, so if the character to k is zero, the statement is that the, this homomorphism, I mean, by this phi, I mean the algebra homomorphism which takes this variable to the element xi. So this homomorphism is an isomorphism. The second part is if the characteristic of k is equal to p, and, so if we assume this, and the p power of each xi is equal to zero, then the map from the k xi's mod xi to the p's to phi is an isomorphism. Okay, so here's the proof. So Nakayama's lemma implies that phi is surjective. The hard part is why is phi injective? Phi is the algebra map that takes xi to xi. Okay. So since the xi map down to a basis of i mod i squared, Nakayama's lemma say that they generate the algebra. So that means phi is, phi is surjective. Okay. So the Key observation for injectivity is this is neat. So uh, you have that. Uh, so you can first differentiate in either of these rings with respect to xi, and then map down to phi to a. And this is equal to applying the derivation di and then doing phi. Oops, sorry, I got that backwards. Applying phi then doing di. So why are these two things equal? Well, they're derivations from this source thing to this target thing. And they agree on the generators xi. Right? So if I stick in xi to this, here I get dxi by dxi, which is 1, and apply phi, and I get 1. And if I do over here, here I get phi of xi, which is xi, and then I apply di to it, and I get 1. Well, I guess you have to do that little computation. di of xi is 1. And di of the xj's is 0. So they, it's obvious that both sides agree when you plug in the xi's. And since they're derivations and the xi's generate the algebras, that means that they agree. So reason is they agree on the xi's and the xi's 
generate as an output. So the important fact that this gives us is that the kernel of phi is stable by derivatives. Right, if I have some f and phi of f is zero, I want to do phi of df that's equal to d of phi of f, so it's zero. And now try to think of an interesting ideal in the polynomial ring, which is stable by derivatives. You can't, right? Because if you have some element, you can apply a derivative and you'll get a smaller degree element. You can keep going down until you get something linear, and you can take the derivative and get one in the ideal. So anything in here, any ideal in here, which is stable by derivatives, has to be the unit ideal of zero. The same thing is not true of k as characteristic p, right? Because x to the p has derivative zero. But in this ring, we've killed everything that has bigger than p's. So the same reasoning still works. So this implies that the kernel of phi is zero. And that gives us our isomorphism. OK, so what's funny about statement A? Statement A should strike you as over here. This is an isomorphism. That should strike you as odd. Yeah, we're dealing with finite dimensional algebras over k. And here we have the polynomial ring. But what does that mean? <laughs> if n is bigger than 0. <laughs> so corollary, if the characteristic of k is 0, then g is trivial. Oh, and here I forgot an important hypothesis, which <laughs> around I'm assuming that g is connected, which is the same as saying that a is local. And then you did that to apply Naki on this lemma. It's not true that every group in characteristic zero is trivial, but every connected group is the trivial group, assuming finiteness. Another corollary, if the characteristic of k is p, then the order of g is a power of p. So this one's not as obvious. Uh, so here's the proof. Uh, so let g1 be the kernel of the Frobenius net. OK, so I didn't actually discuss this Frobenius net completely in this situation, but it's always a group homomorphism. So it's kernels and it's closed subgroup. And let g2 be the quotient. So G1 you get by taking the coordinate ring for G and killing all the P powers of the XIs. I guess that's an exercise you should do. But the point is that you can apply B to G1. You can't necessarily apply it to G because it might not be true that every element has P power 0. But this G1 does satisfy that. So B implies that G1 is equal to spec of K joins some XIs mod XIs to the P as a scheme. And that algebra in there, I mean, you can write down a basis for it, just thinking about what this idea looks like. And it has size p to the n, minus the number of variables. And since the size of g, cardinality of g, or I should say order, the order of g is the order of g1 times the order of g2, this lets you continue by induction. g2 has smaller order. You can do the same trick to g2 and break it up. Keep going. So, done by induction. Does that make sense? Okay, and so the real lesson from all of this, the important statement to remember, I'll write it as a proposition. If G is a finite commutative group scheme over K, and the order of G is invertible, K, then G is that. And the reason is to apply the connected tau sequence, right? And so if you look at the, the kernel, 
in the G0 that's connected and the order's invertible. If you think about what that means in terms of this, it has to be true. And this doesn't actually require commutativity. If you look in Tate's article, it proves it. Okay, so this is important. This is why when we're in characteristic P, when we look at the L torsion of the elliptic curve, it behaves so nicely. I guess we already knew that that situation was a tau, but this kind of implies it for free. Uh, okay, so are there any questions? This is it for today. All right. So next time, we'll do a little more on group schemes over fields, and then we'll talk a little about group schemes over DVRs.